For those that don't know me, I am uh, Matthew Gibb. I am one of Brooks Patterson's deputy executives, but I think all of you have heard that from me before, so we're going to get on with the program. Um, the reason I'm using the microphone is we have seven communities that are our first seven communities in the One Stop Ready program. Uh, so raise your hand if you're from a community where every ZBA, every planning commissioner, and every board or council member has come tonight. Raise your hand if you're that community. Yeah, we didn't expect it, but that's okay. Uh, so the reason I'm using the microphone and the reason we want you to talk loud if you have questions uh, or if you have comments, uh, and the reason Dan and everybody else use the microphone is we're recording this so that your colleagues, if they choose to watch um, these academy sessions, can watch it, and they can actually hear what we're saying. Uh, and so if this seems a little odd, it is certainly it's a lot easier for me to do this. I need to do this as they explain to me. Uh, so welcome on behalf of our entire staff of uh, economic development, the certainly Burst Patterson. All of you know what the program is about. Uh, what tonight is about is the excitement that this is our first academy session in the program. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, I'm coming as we said we were going to come. Uh, but tonight is really intended to kick off the mentality of what One Stop Ready is all about. Uh, it's not about formal, formal presentations. It's not about stuffiness. It's not about just listening to us. Uh, this program is designed to be an interactive, learn from each other, figure out the best way to do something, uh, do it quick and efficiently, and everybody get lots, gets lots of credit. Uh, there is no greater feeling. Now, I came from the private sector. I was an attorney that represented developers for almost 20 years. There is no greater joy in the, in the mind of an attorney that represents the developer than to walk into a community and have the community outsmart them. Uh, that's what this program is designed to do. It's not designed to teach you how to prove anything or how to deny anything. It's not really designed to do anything about your master plan or your ordinances from 1952. That's for different types of sessions. This is learning how we learn from each other to outsmart the developer, not to defeat them, but to make them happy about who you are, uh, who your community is. Uh, and so we've got uh, members from seven communities. Who Raise your hand if you don't know all seven communities. Oh, Sue doesn't know all seven communities. Sue, thanks for being courageous. Because nobody else knows who the seven communities are either. Don't worry about it, all right? All right, so seven communities. We're very excited that two of the communities are doing this together. Oxford Village, Oxford Township. Raise your hand if you're from the Oxfords. I know that the, the word got a little bit light as to Oxford because they thought it was only the liaison to come today. We've got a few representatives from Oxford. We're very excited the village and the township are doing this together. Now, guess why someone like me would be excited? Uh, we are trying to get our communities in Oakland County to start doing basic things similar. Not the same. Everybody has to do it their own way, but doing it similar. So we have two communities, the village and the township in Oxford, that said, well, we're going to learn together. Uh, that makes me really excited that they're doing this. Another community is Lyon Township. Who's from Lyon Township? Raise your hand. We've got some Lyon Township folks. Uh, everybody know where Lyon Township is? Well, I'll issue a passport later. It takes about two hours to fly there. Uh, far west side, you know, Lyon Township. We're very excited about Lyon Township. Lyon Township's claim to fame right now, at least in my mind, is they have more new housing starts, I think, than anybody in the county. Uh, they are killing everybody in residential development, and they should be very, very proud of that. Uh, Wixom, if you're from Wixom, I see Tony's here and a few others. Hey, kudos to Wixom. You didn't all sit at the same table. Uh, uh, Ryan all sat at the same table. They're scared to meet people. They understand. Maybe you can greet each other later. It's okay, but Wixom. Uh, Wixom's uh, another one of these communities that are dynamic in the way that they know who they are uh, and they really strive to get there. If you're from Pontiac, raise your hand. Who's from Pontiac? We've got some Pontiac folks and a great mix. I think it might be the largest turnout from Pontiac. Give yourselves a hand. Uh, 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 this is good. Uh, I look at Pontiac because it has this new attitude on it. Uh, they know who, who they've been, they know who they want to be, and damn it, they're going to get there quick, right? So it's good. Uh, if you're from Auburn Hills, I see some Auburn Hills folks up in front, a couple tables here in front. Uh, of course, Auburn Hills beats everybody in economic development, right? So uh, not really. You guys can even learn, too, some of the strategies and tricks that everybody else does. Uh, and of course, Waterford Township. Who's from Waterford? All right, we've got a big contingency from Waterford. Look at all the water. You might even meet, a, meet Pontiac. Great to go. Way to go. So seven communities. My staff is already a little frustrated with me because we're already starting to recruit the next seven communities that we want to get into the program. Uh, and we've got communities that are knocking on the door. Communities like Orient Township and Royal Oak, if you can be, believe it, Madison Heights and others that are knocking on the door saying, hey, get rid of those schmucks. They know what they're doing already. Let's move on with this program. 
on it. So we're very excited you're here to kick off our academy. Uh, so, Brett, how do I move these slides? Just hit the button here? Or you're going to do it. Oh, oh, look at that. How nice. Uh, so just a quick overview. The purpose of the program. All of you have heard this. Now understand, we launched this program in January of last year, 2012, and we're just now getting to our first academy session. That's because we've been trying to refine what the heck the purpose is in the first place. We don't want this program to be about anybody telling you what to do. We want this program to be about you deciding who you are as a community, what your role in the economy is, what are your assets and strengths, but not in a sense of, oh, we've got to, we've got to rewrite things and we've got to do new vision planning and master planning. There are some phenomenal other initiatives out there for that that we're going to encourage you to do, like the State's Redevelopment Readiness Program through the MEDC. It's a great initiative to look at a deeper analysis of your vision and your master plan. We're not about that. We're about understanding what are some simple best practice and process in customer service, in introducing yourself to the customer when they come in, about when you hear the idea, you have a good knowledge base of saying, you know, I know what my community is really going for, what we're strong at. Uh, maybe it doesn't work on this corner, but around the corner, I can introduce you to that guy that owns that property. Having a good sense of who you are on it and being ready and efficient. Uh, now, you guys already forwarded the slide. Am I, am I behind already? Oh, huh? I'm planning ahead. Oh, you're planning ahead. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm allowed to take more time than, than they want me to, but that's okay. The challenge of what we're going to do, the whole program is designed around thinking like an investor. None of you are expected to do that. But when someone walks into your community, you have to be able to say to yourself, whether you're a planning commissioner or board member, whether you're a city manager, whether you're a planner, whether you're a consultant sitting there, you have to say, what's in the mind of this person? Why are they here? Too many, too often we think in our communities, well, they're here because um, they want to take advantage of us, or they want to overbuild their site, or they don't really care about who we are. Trust me, I represent that community. They do care about who you are. They do want to hear who you want to be. They do hear about, want to hear about the aesthetics. They just want to hear about them quickly. They want to hear about your process and your efficiency. You have to start thinking like an investor. The investor thinks about when do I need to open, when do I need to hire people. They don't think about what color the brick needs to be that your planning commission is going to insist upon. They know those questions will come, but you have to start thinking like an investor. That's the purpose of, of this program. Why have they chosen the thing? I'll start speeding up. Sorry. Uh, so the four components. So you know what you've gotten yourself into. Tonight is component number one of the One Stop Ready Academies. There will be four academies. Uh, all of them are going to be first led by us a little bit just to set the context. All of them then will be led by your peers. Tonight we have one of your peers from Farmington that will be here, one of the consultants that work in our community. You are instructed to listen to them. They're your friends. They're not your competitors. They're not trying to put your community out of business. They're here to say, here's one thing we do really, really well. Uh, and we're hoping we can share some of our ideas so you can take it back to your colleagues and adopt those back in your community in some way. And so four academies, tools and strategies. Eventually when you get into this program, we have simplified this down to some basic things that we will insist you do in your community. You must have pre-application meetings. You must. Steve, they went straight. Uh, Auburn Hills doesn't touch anything without having a pre-application meeting. That stands for everything. I was so proud the other day I went to Oregon where I came from. Uh, and they were holding a pre-app meeting while I was there. I didn't do that on purpose. Uh, so I just kind of stumbled into it. Uh, they were asking the questions that we want them to ask. Pre-app meetings are so important. We're not going to teach you how to do that. We think some communities do those really well. We're going to ask those communities to teach them. Internet accessibility. When I go to China, do you think that a company in China that wants to come locate in your community has time to fly over here, walk into your clerk's office and get the forms that some of you still have that you require them to fill out? They don't. If they're from Japan or Germany or Toledo, they don't have time to come here. We're going to talk to you about what are the best practices for getting all your stuff online, uh, the ways that you can do that cost effectively. Project tracking. Do you have a mechanism so that you know when things have to happen? We live by a certain rule that says, when do you need to open? If they say, well, in about 47 days, your job as a community is to say, well, let's figure out how to do that. Uh, what is the tracking device? How do you do that? Have your peers kind of teach you how to do that. Do you have a viable business input mechanism? Who has a business roundtable in their community? Joe does, one, I see a couple. Really, you're that shy about it. You should be cheering from the mountaintops that you have a business roundtable. Brooks Patterson has had a business roundtable for 20 years. Uh, it's so popular that Paul W. Smith broadcasts his radio program from it every year when we hear the recommendations of the business community. You need to have a business perspective in everything you do. It's not about what you think. 
Sorry, it's not. If you want a growing and vibrant community, it's about what the check writer thinks. The person, the company, the man, the woman, the child sometimes, the college kid. They want to come invest in your community. Why are they there? They're not there to hear your opinion. They're not. They're there to be guided by you, for you to tell them the context of your community, who you're hoping to be, for you to help them through the process. How quickly can you write that, that check to us? Business input. And finally, the permitting process, but that's a broader topic. Lastly, we're going to talk about marketing and then the One Stop Ready forums, which are going to be all of you sharing your successes at the end. So that's the program in an overview. Uh, don't run away. We're not going to allow you to quit. Because now you're in. You've all signed the poster for One Stop Ready. That means you've committed to something. So tonight, you're going to listen to these hopefully good ideas, setting the context of what the program is all about, and then you're going to take that back to your peers. Now, when I sat on the Zoning Board of Appeals, Appeals 20 years ago, uh, and I used to come in and give different types of questions to things. My peers on the zoning board, they loved that. They didn't always vote the way I wanted them to vote. On it. I tried to encourage them, well, this is a pretty good thing, let's encourage this way. And they said, no, we just don't agree. But I asked different types of questions because I was informed. And I had knowledge, but that was only because I did it for a career. People paid me to do that. So what we're hoping you get out of this program is not everybody can come to these. That you'll learn, you'll go back to your peers. So when you sit on your council or your board, your planning commission, You'll have a different perspective. You might ask a different question. Your colleague on the board might think, well, why are they asking that? You'll start to learn from each other. Uh, and so that's what we're trying to do. Everybody's connected in this room, but everybody's connected geographically. So let's start talking about the context of things. All right, go to the next slide. All right. So this is the population of our community. So, Oakland County, of course. How do you think these people decided to live here? Or these people over here? When someone moved to the region, what, where did they pick? I mean, they seem to be living all over the place. Close to Detroit. Oh, they're close to Detroit. That's pretty good. I right, go to the next slide. Well, here's working age population. Here's where everybody works. Uh, so they're kind of by where they want to work, right? So if I look at these charts, and I'm thinking the employment, I don't go to the next one just yet. Let's think about this one now. So if you're a community that's here, and you're looking at Oakland County, and you think, okay, well, this is where everybody works, what are you doing that distinguishes yourself from another community to attract that person to buy a house, to live there? What are you doing to attract them to build something in your community? Or, I mean, why are they picking you? And this is really the crux of One Stop Ready, is when someone walks into your door, they contact you on the internet, they send you an email, and the city manager an email, I want to develop the Wixom site. I know it'd be a miracle, Tony, but we'll get there, we'll get there. Uh, why are they doing that? Why are they choosing you? Are they choosing your business by the freeway? Are they saying, well, I want to build a house in your community? Are they doing it because you've got great trail network? What is it? Why are they filling these dots? Uh, well, we know another thing, go to the next slide, we know why they choose Oakland County. Right now we have almost 400,000 people that live here and work here. Uh, but the more exciting thing for us is how many people come here. Uh, we have more than 100,000 people that live in Wayne County that come into Oakland County every day to work. Macomb County, 90,000 people. Look at that, there's only 37 going the other way. 90,000 people come from Macomb County to our county to work. You can just see the trend in numbers. Uh, so not only do we have 400,000 people that already live and work here, uh, we have a couple hundred thousand more that come here every day. So why do they do that? Why does a company want to locate in Auburn Hills as opposed to Southfield? Is it these patterns? Have you ever even thought about that? When a company comes in to ask you to build something or to remodel a building or to tear down the Showcase Center, I'm very excited about that. Very excited about that project. Uh, why are they doing that? Have you thought about that question as a planning commissioner or as a consultant? Why on God's earth is Tejin coming here or Plasan Industries and Wixon? Why are they coming here? Where are their employees coming from? What's the commuting patterns that are out there? What's your role in the economy? What type of businesses are locating there? If you're Oxford, are you getting this type of directional activity? Are people from Lapeer County coming down, Genesee coming down? Uh, you probably never thought of those questions. Uh, but if you're really in-depth as an economic developer, you're going to start to think of these. 
what is our role in the economic context of things? Uh, well, we say it's about how you view it. So I'm going to tell you a story, just like you used to in the bedtime story. Dane and Pontiac, he, he gets these every night still from his mom. Uh, so a short bond time story. We like to tell the story here in Oakland County of why they come to Oakland County. We know how, how they view us, and it's encapsulated in our bond. Uh, so we go every year, we talk to Moody's and Standard and Poor's, and we tell them why they come to Oakland County. Uh, well, we're AAA bond rated, no longer than any county in America. So what would you say about your community? Would you say we're AAA bond rated? Or would you say we've got a cool senior center? Or would you say we've got 50 miles of trip? What would you say? So in Oakland County, we say things like we have a great bond rating. Uh, um, what are some of the other things and why they view us uh, in our bond time story? I'm trying to expedite our time here. Uh, oh, we do multi-year budgeting. Uh, so when business comes to your community, what do you say? Why are they choosing you? Do you say anything at all? Now, I saw in Prosper Magazine, I grabbed one of these earlier. Uh, so some of you are in here, in the Prosper Magazine. Uh, so we have some communities in here that um, uh, they have little catchphrases. Now, I won't pick on any of your communities. I learned that lesson a long time ago. Don't pick on my friends. Pick on my non-friends, right? No, I'm kidding. Uh, so um, like Holland. Holly's in there. It's a great little town. It's Halifax. Holly has a history of hauntings. The historic Holly Hotel is listed among the most haunted historical places in Michigan. Well, I guess if you're trying to locate a haunted house, that'd be kind of cool. It might attract you there. But it might attract you there because you think, well, that's a unique place to live, right? Uh, or in the 1860s, Holly became the first railroad junction in the state. Or Holly is home to Wingomire Furniture, one of the oldest family-owned businesses in Michigan. Now, I know this is like just a community guide, so I'm not picking on Holly. Really not. Don't tell them I'm picking on but if someone was going to choose you for economic purposes, or someone that even lives in your community that wants to stay there, and they say, well, I really want to stay here, but i got to add on to my house because my mom's about to move back in with me, or my college kid's about to move back in with me, or you know, we've had a one-and-a-half car garage since 1946. It's time to get a bigger garage. You know, maybe they just want to stay there. Why are they staying there? Why aren't they moving from your community to Plymouth or someplace else? Huh? Do you tell them like we do multi-year budget? Huh? <laughs> the soothsayer? It should be Brooks, right? Huh? So, you know, we tell them these things. How do we view ourselves? Go ahead, Brent, to the next one. Uh, we also tell them these types of things. What is the economic context of things? Uh, do you think about when you're making decisions for the vision of your community about the economic context of where you're at? Do you think about where your budget is? Do you think about how many jobs something will bring? Do you know the relationship between all of those things? So we tell these figures. Like, we've got a new campaign in our, our division. It goes back to 03, which we'll show on the next slide, called the Race of the Decade. We want to take all of these negative numbers and just get rid of them all. Uh, so we need more of these positive numbers. So the last two years, we had almost 50,000 total jobs. Those are net private sector jobs. This is the U of M forecast going forward. So we tell this story. You want to come to Oakland County? We can provide workforce. We can provide jobs. So what do, you, what do you tell them when they come in the door? Do you tell them, well, um, if you want to do something, that's great. Let me go get my master plan out, and the forms are in a drawer somewhere. Uh, what is your story that you tell them when they come to your community? This is a pretty good story. Now, how many of you have heard Brooks tell this story? All of you have, right? You've all heard Brooks tell this story. Uh, so what else is our economic context? What are we trying to do now? What are we trying to fill? This is the unemployment rate. Yeah, it's not a pretty picture right now. It was pretty good back in 2000, though, wasn't it? 2.9% in 2000. So if you had business coming to town in 2000 and we were at 2.9%, I dare say you could probably tell them anything you darn well please, couldn't you? Uh, right? No, well, you want to open that business here? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, we're busy. Right? Uh, you you, you might have got away with it. But it doesn't look so good going forward, really. So we started from 03 to 13 in my office. Uh, so in 03, we were where? We were just under 6%, maybe 5.8% in 03. That's pretty good. I'd like to be at 5.8% countywide right now. And then we kind of got bad, didn't we? 09, we were up to 13%. Uh, and we're getting better. Uh, you know, at the end of 12, we're down just under 9. And we're projecting to be just under 7. But we're a heck of a long way away from 2000, aren't we? So what does it take to do this? Now think about it. If you're a council person, or you're a planner, or you're an engineer for a community, or you're a ZBA member, 
Uh, do you even think about when somebody comes in and says, I'd like to do this in your community, do you even think for a minute where your unemployment rate is? Or who that business is going to employ? Or how they're going to find their employees? I mean, I'm not saying you have to, but do you think about it at least? I mean, if somebody's sitting in front of you and you say, you know, I want to build a sonic restaurant, uh, do you think first about, oh, damn, the neighbor's going to have to listen to the squawk box, or do you think, wow, they employ like 62 people in a sonic restaurant? Uh, and there's like seven full-timers, that's pretty good. We'd like to have seven more full-time places like Pontiac, probably like to have 62 more jobs, right? Uh, are you thinking about this? We show you this to put all of you in the framework of what's the total economic context. Dan's going to talk in a minute about it's not as good as you think, really, because there's a bigger hole that we have to fill. So unemployment rate, we're trying to strive towards that. But we tell this story. The bond rating agents say, if you can get to 6.9%, we'll maintain your AAA bond rating. We think that's not good enough. Go to the next slide, Brett. Uh, so here's the other thing that I want you to be thinking about. A, a couple of examples. So somebody came to me with a project the other day, and they said they went into a community in Oakland County, said we'd like to do this project. And they went they found a master plan, probably dusted it off a little bit. They opened the master plan, the area they were looking, they said, sorry, it's not, that area is not master plan for that. Is that the first response we give to somebody? <laughs> We, we had 13% unemployment just two years ago, three years ago. Is the master plan even your first choice to look for anything right now? No. It shouldn't be, right? Master plan's a guide. You have to have one. We want you to do that vision planning. We want you to have documents that you can rely upon that are guiding your long-term process and your long-term planning. But you can't look at the master plan right now because we don't even know where the sectors are anymore that people are wanting to be employed in. So think of this. The two different colors. 1990 is the blue, 2012 is the orange. Manufacturing. We're half as much as we were in 1990. If your master plan has areas that are designed for light industrial, for manufacturing, those types of things, uh -huh. you're down 8%, almost 7.2, but you're cut in half in manufacturing. If your master plan doesn't fully define what our professional and business services, really define what on God's earth are you looking for? What are you trying to do there? If your master plan says research and development, and you don't have a better understanding as a community of who the heck you're trying to get in your community, you're missing the boat because you're going from 18 to 25. These are just numbers and trends and things that are going on. If you start to look at the rest of it, health services. We have a community in Oakland County that in the Prosper magazine they brag about they're a leader in health services in their community but they have a more than a billion dollar project that they've delayed for nine months. They haven't even accepted the plan submission yet because they're worried about, well, what's the ancillary tax base that's going to be there? But you're bragging that you're a health service expert community. We have to have an understanding of who we are. And once we understand who we are, well, who are we trying to get? So when we look at the breakdown of where these jobs lie, do we even know? So in manufacturing, it's cut in half. But do we even know what we're looking for? So Tony and Wixom, you've got carbon fiber companies. You don't have steel plants in Wixom. You have emerging sectors technology companies. Auburn Hill's the same way. Uh, do they fit in your traditional model for manufacturing? When you're a planning commissioner and you're sitting on the board and a project comes in, do you even have a context of where your demographics are for the companies that are even in your community? Do you even know what you have already? For professional and business services, you know, professional, scientific, and technical, if you lump that and say, well, we want R&D companies, do you know what you're looking for? Have you given that thought? What type of company is moving in? And so the program for One Stop Ready is designed to start getting you just thinking about that stuff. Nobody's going to give you a mag magic potion. Nobody's going to tell you necessarily what to do. Uh, but it's designed to have you start thinking about the context of who you're trying to be. And then how do you get there? How do you attract these companies? Go ahead. I think I'm to the point of almost handing off. All right, so times have changed. So I'm going to quit talking because I've been up since 4.30 and clearly getting out of breath for some reason talking. Uh, and Dan's going to take over and talk about the economic context. But here's how the times are changing on things. And I'll give you an example. I always use the same example. You've heard it before. So when I was supervisor in Oregon, Taco Bell wanted to build a restaurant at the interchange of 75 and Baldwin Road. 
a big commercial area. We've all been to Great Lakes Crossing. I know you all have, even if you live in South Lyon. You've probably been there. All right? So, Taco Bell restaurant across the freeway. Be a nice spot for one. Orient Township, right after I got elected, said no. But they didn't really say no. They just tabled them to death until they finally went away. And it took us a year to get them back. And then I almost had to fire everybody to get them to approve a Taco Bell restaurant on I-75 in Baldwin Road. I mean, if you can imagine in your community the message that that sends. So when we say, how do people view you? I'm not talking about how your best friend at the coffee shop views you. They already like you. Uh, they like you personally, and they like the community. I'm talking about how do the executives at Young Brands from Louisville and Pittsburgh view you? If you table them to death. If you ask questions like, well, are, you, are there enough trees on the plant? And then you don't answer your own question. You just say, well, I'm going to table this for 30 days so I can see another plan. Now, the good news story on that is Orion, the, the pre-op meeting that I walked in on the other day, is they're going to put a Sonic next to them. That's why Sonic popped into my head a minute ago. Uh, they have already conditionally approved in one meeting at the Planning Commission the Sonic plan, and the ZBA has already made the variances. They're going to go from start to finish in about 47 days. It took the Taco Bell three years. It took the Sonic 47 days. Now, guess which plan they used? The one-stop rate plan. They had a pre-op meeting. They sat down and they figured out all the problems. They said, yeah, the zoning doesn't work, it never has. And we jammed that Taco Bell in there even though we didn't want to. But now it's wildly successful. Uh, they had a pre-op meeting. <laughs> they had all their stuff online. So when the corporate guys from Sonic needed it, they just went online and they got it. Uh, they had marketing outreach, which means they designed that. They actually sent out flyers of their own to other nationals to say, can you come locate here? They marketed it. They did all the things that we're talking about. They knew who they were, finally. They knew who they wanted to be, finally. They understood their economic context. But here was the coup de grace in the pre meeting for me, and then I'll hand it over to Dan. But he's going to talk about the coup de grace for me. One of the people at the table said, can you tell me what your deadline is at your national approval process for the Sonic restaurant at Baldwin I-75? And then the next question was, and I want to tell the Planning Commission when I do my report, what's the total investment in the job number that this is going to bring so we can do a taxable analysis for what this means for the community. Now, who has asked that? Dan, have you asked that question at the Planning Commission later? Uh, no. no, you haven't, have you? Uh, who has asked of any project in the last year, uh, and be honest, because I want to applaud you if you have, um, how many jobs is your, your facility going to bring so I can do an analysis of what that means for the economics of my community? With that, Dan's going to start you thinking about that. Thank you, Matt. Oh, he's tough to follow. <clears throat> One cup of coffee? Was that it? Uh, my name is Dan Hunter, and I'm Deputy Director of our Economic Development Community Affairs Department. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I came out to many of your communities uh, to help with a resolution of support, and uh, it was a lot of fun. From a huge turnout in Lyon Township to the folks in Wixom saying, we're on board, we don't need a lot of people, you got five minutes and get out of here. <laughs> um, in Waterford, uh, waiting to have Marie Houseworth with the Chamber, uh, who is such a vital part of the Waterford community. So right there it tells you there's not one size fits all. Um, what, uh, one of the best things about working for Oakland County is working for Brooks Patterson and his leadership. And in terms of economic development, it's really simple. In, in, in almost his master plan for a community, it boils down to, and you've heard him say this, it all comes down to a job. If we're creating jobs, we're in good shape. If we're losing them, we're not so good. If we have the jobs, we can have some of the luxuries. The judges on the bench, the cops on the street, the nice parks and rec, that's the importance of jobs and investment. Crystal clear. And so his support uh, for what we do has been unwavering, as has our Board of Commissioners, um, in good times and bad. Think back to a slide back uh, when Matt was showing the, uh, the high water mark, if you will, 2009, or 2000 and, uh, 2001 or 2003 when we were at 2.9% unemployment. 
that summer, a bunch of us here joined Automation Alley, and we went to uh, Las Vegas, to Condex. Why? To recruit people. We were at such a, a, a low unemployment rate, that's what we were up to. So that Prosper magazine, we, we took, I don't know, they, what, we took 100,000 of those out there. Um, that's the situation we want to get back to again. Uh, it's unacceptable at 7.5%. We're getting there, but well, it's unacceptable. So, so Matt gave you really some pretty good slides and positive story, and look at what I get. If you've been feasting your eyes on this, this is a pretty picture, isn't it? Wow. How deep is the hole? Talk about economic context. So the taxable value, I mean, this is what we've been living. Um, ditto state of Michigan and to a lesser extent the country. So there's some comfort in that. But our taxable value went down almost 30% since 2007 as a county. Some communities more, some less. The forecast going forward, uh, fairly recent numbers, and they changed up to the positive, is that 2013 were a wash, zero. 2014, 15, 1% increase. 2016, 2%. We'll take it. Sure a lot better than 29, 30% in the hole, but we have a lot of catching up to do. This slide is also synonymous with uh, one of our top financial people, Deputy County Executive Bob Dado. Often goes by the name of Dr. Doom. But if we didn't have someone like that looking at these figures and putting us on a three-year budget, we wouldn't be in very good shape. So we have to look, we have to look at it. His estimate is that we get back to where we were in 2007 somewhere between 2020 and 2025. So between seven and 12 years, that's still a long way out. One of my, one of my kids will probably be married by then. <clears throat> the, the gross tax levy, go back one, Brett. Uh, you can see the county levy's gone down from 271 to 206 million. <clears throat> And yet, the cost of doing business for all of us is not going down. Vendors, fuel, contracts, health care. How are we going to get that back? That's the question. We can cut, and we have cut. We may cut some more. But there's probably a limit to that. So how do we get it back? Oh, we've also got a couple other things out there. The proposal A. We're constrained by that. And the loss of personal property tax. Now, I say that's good from a recruiting standpoint for businesses, but we have to deal with it. And that's going to hit us over the next decade. So we've, we've had some fun with this economic modeling tool. A few years ago, uh, staff found something from the Federal Reserve Board that allows us to model, really simply, uh, a potential project. So we took the seven communities and a parcel of land and tried to figure out the best land use, came up with some assumptions in terms of investment amount. And the one you're looking at is Berlion Township. And this was, uh, this is in downtown New Hudson. Six points, now five points. And uh, a, a parcel that's been vacant for quite a few years and uh, a mixed-use development. What this tool allows you to do, besides the investment of the project, it also gets into that uh, multiplier or spin-off effect. So it'll, it'll project how many indirect jobs are supported. It's not a perfect tool. Um, this is an economic tool. And economists are like weather men and weather women job security, but it kind of gives you a figure, like, like Matt was saying, 
we could do this on just about every project. We could have a sense for well, well, what's what's the gain. So it looks at indirect jobs. Um, it also says, geez, for the 30 new jobs that would be created by this mixed-use development in Lane Township, there would be six new houses, or the value of six houses. So it starts getting into areas well beyond the $1.2 million payroll that now is there, that perhaps wasn't, and the new taxes, it starts estimating some of the residential, which I, I think is, is really cool. Um, I'm not going to go through all seven. Uh, as Brad indicated uh, when we started, they're, they're around the room. Um, what, you, what you will see, though, um, for, for a community that has a manufacturing project, it has a higher multiplier effect. Um, thus, when there's an automotive assembly facility, and they're really sought after, this huge multiplier effect. Look at where we are now with the GM Orient plant back at, I guess, full production. The multiplier on an automotive assembly facility is anywhere from three other jobs are created in the community up to seven. I've heard it anywhere from three to seven. Uh, corporate headquarters are also pretty solid. Uh, retailing is less so. It might be half of another job or a third of another job for each job that's created. So that's something to think about. But that's all figured in. You know, Federal Reserve, their, their model and their tool was pretty good. So we took the seven hypothetical projects and ran the numbers. And you can see the different size, um, and it's, it's totally debatable what those projects were. But uh, the net tax gain is about $1.2 million if we were to snap our fingers and those projects were to be built. Um, to, the, to all taxing entities, be $1.2 million. Now this starts getting us toward that hole and alleviating the hole. Next slide. Well, how deep is that? We talked about $65 million for county operating. And if we take the seven projects, $1.2 million. How much of that is the county portion? Somebody's really good with math and they'll probably have an answer. <clears throat> of the $1.2 million, Hundred and ninety thousand. Now that's a head in the right direction. That's not a very big number, at least for the county. We need a whole lot of that to get to sixty five million. And that again just gets us back to where we were. That doesn't really move it that much forward. Another uh, not analogy something called our Emerging Sectors Program. Uh, Brooks kicked off in 2004, a uh, business diversification program. And so our staff went hard, along with many of the communities here and around Oakland County, to pursue generally non-traditional, non-automotive. That was really pretty big in Oakland County, things like uh, life sciences and medical devices and robotics and so we started that in 2004 and you might have heard last week we had a party Brooks said my gosh we gotta thank these companies about 225 of them that we've never said thank you so he's he said we're gonna do that on June 18th and we said geez we have six weeks to pull this off <laughs> And he said, we're going to do it at the palace. Oh, my gosh. Uh, but those 225 companies, again, with a lot of your help, 
have invested two and a half billion dollars since 2004, really 2005. And I'll never forget, never forget, when we started the program, Matt, you were doing your real estate stuff. Um, Brooks said, I would be happy if we had four or five successes in four or five years. <clears throat> I try to remind him of that. <clears throat> and every, the first of every month, and this is on our website, we publish how we did in the last month with those emerging sectors. And then other traditional sectors. <clears throat> and so 225 projects, two and a half billion dollars. A lot of jobs. The investment amount for the county on, on those projects was about six million dollars. That's uh, figured out based on the businesses, what, what they told us was their investment for equipment, real estate. So six million. 220, that's a lot of work and a lot of projects. Certainly isn't all of them in Oakland County. And then we figured that the total tax take uh, for all taxing entities is about 63, 64 million dollars. That's a pretty big number. But we're still kind of chipping away. So thus the importance of economic context. Now I minored in economics and I wanted to come up here with supply chain charts and figures, but I think this tells the story a lot better. So we're regional, we're connected, you saw the population, the, the commuting patterns is a great chart. We can use that to, to market Oakland County. You saw the workforce and how it's changing. We're less manufacturing, it is what it is. I grew up in a manufacturing family. I wish it was more, and we'll do anything we can to support it, but it's, it's not, it's professional business services. So in summary, the importance of investment. You can see it in the numbers. So everything that comes to you, that might be another question in your mind. What's their time frame? And what is the potential investment? And everything starts with a job. So with that, how are we doing on time? Good. Pretty good? Going to get involved. Going to wake up? So um, now you guys get involved. Uh, so we're going to have you answer some questions. But before we talk about that, some of you have heard me reference this guide. We're going to give each of your community another hard copy tonight. And then it's um, email everything to every participant. And not only that's here, but everybody that's in the seven communities. National League of Cities, with the help of the um, uh, International Economic Development Council, did this study a few years ago. Uh, and it's the role of local elected officials in economic <coughs> development, 10 things you should know. Um, this is where the knucklehead that's got the mic right now, we do R&D in our office, rip off and duplicate. We're kind of rip offing and duplicating, uh, which is good, because very, very smart people have created this. Uh, so as Brett's getting the clicker thing ready to go, uh, uh, just think about these in the context of the questions that we're about to answer. Uh, so they have, they have 10 areas. Knowing your local economic strengths and weaknesses. Now, that doesn't mean that you've got the best planner and attorney in the world. Uh, it means something different, even if you do have the best planner and attorney. Um, your community's place in the broader regional economy. Uh, with a firmer grasp of how your community fits into the broader region, you're better prepared to work with other jurisdictions to share responsibility for regional economic success. At some point in this program, all of you are going to start talking too, is the idea is for you to start sharing. I mean, something might not be right for Pontiac, but it sure as heck might be right for Wixom. And I bet you'd like to know through this process what Wixom's doing so that when that opportunity comes in your door, it doesn't go to Indiana. Uh, it just goes to your neighbor. Uh, because then people might not want to live in Wixom, it's a nice place, but they might not want to live in Wixom, they might want to live in Pontiac. Uh, and we all start working together regionally. Your community's economic development vision and goals. What are you trying to do? You trying to fill the hole? I know when I was in Oregon, we were trying to fill the hole. Uh, we had $3 million budget shortfall, we had to fill the hole. I put slides up that said, you know, you don't approve the Taco Bells, what you're losing, man. Uh, you know, how are you going to make up the hole? Maybe that's your vision, I don't know. Your community strategy to attain its goals. 
Once again, is a master plan an economic strategy for your community? If you say yes, I'm going to punch you. <laughs> no, but you have to have a strategy. Steve, is the master plan Auburn Hill's strategy for economic development? No. No, I, would, I wouldn't, wouldn't think so at all. Uh, connections between economic development and city policies. Your regulatory environment. When somebody walks in the door, do you first say, well, where's your checkbook? Because we charge about $20,000 in fees around here before you even talk to you. I mean, what's your regulatory environment? Some communities still do that. They say, well, you know, you got to fill your escrow accounts first. You know, so maybe you can ask for the money later. Invite them in first. You never know. Uh, your local economic development stakeholders and partner. Who in your community are the stakeholders? Is it, you know, the engineer and the planner and the guys that are, are you see every day? Or are the stakeholders the, you know, you saw some guy at the coffee shop that had blueprints in his satchel. Did you introduce yourself? Who's the stakeholders in your community? The needs of your local business community, your community's economic development message. You sure as heck know what, what Oakland County says. It's called Brooks Patterson, right? I mean, he sells emerging sectors. He sells medical Main Street. You have to have a message. Your economic development staff. So, with that in mind, questions? Yep, uh, yeah, you guys ready? Who's, whoever's got a clicker, you're going to answer questions. Well, uh, we have a gentleman here that needs a clicker anymore. More clickers? We need more clickers. They're, um, the staff scurries. The question will come up. It's pretty simple. You press the button to vote. You can only vote mm -hmm. once. If you, if you change your mind, if there's no hanging chads either, by the way. If you change your mind, <laughs> you, you can change your vote. The last button you press is your uh, is your good vote. Now, the first one is just a warm-up question, so you're going to hang up uh, how this works. So here's the first question. What tiger or tigers do you miss the most? Okay. All right. This is good. <laughs> and I'm watching the votes tally up in the bottom of See? the screen there. So we're getting all 60 or so. All right. Keep, right. Voting. Keep going. Keep voting. So this is cool. 1975 tops cards. Uh, who knows what year tops card this is? 71. No, 71, isn't it? 1971 in the middle? Might be 70. 68 had the little round thing at the bottom. The, like wood frame. That's not the question, sorry. We there yet? Only 49. All right. Everyone done? Done? <laughs> no, it's not like Detroit where we vote often. All right. All right. Well, we're really going up here like Gates Brown. I can't believe you didn't pick. And, and I love how the staff called him Joe Valverde. That's great. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's good. Bunch of baseball fans are out here. <laughs> all right, so real questions now. All right, answer these honestly. I, I promise I won't pick on you. All right. How ready, responsive, and flexible is your community in responding to investment opportunities? Now answer this honestly. Answers are coming slower this time, Brett. Uh, they're not sure. Uh, 40, 47, she should be up pretty close to 60 here. Oh, uh, here come a few more stragglers, they're coming in. Everyone set? All right, so let's see the totals. So what do you guys think of your community? So you either think, you, you think you're ready or you are somewhat ready. So who's the 9% that said not sure? Yeah, I'm not going to pick any too bad. Somebody said not sure. Who said not sure? 9% of you said, oh, MEDC people. It's okay. Who said not sure? I know 9%. Was it one person? Only? Three people voted. See, now you won't even admit it. If you're not sure and you won't admit it, uh, uh, three people voted. All right. Who said we are the best? Of course, Auburn Hills, right? Yeah, Auburn Hills did. Yeah, Auburn Hills said we are the best. All right. All right. All right. All right. So let's talk real quick about we think we're responsive or we're somewhat ready. These are very similar answers, aren't they? Uh, we think so. We, we, we know. So who, who is the brave soul that answered that that can say what, what they meant by that when they answered that? we got to have one brave soul. Mayor, what, why do you only think that you're responsive? Politician, yes, we've we've contracted out our building department. We're still uh, sort of transitioning from the old system to the new, and so it's it's better, but it it's not where it needs to be. So who, who else answered that they 
think or they're somewhat ready. Uh, oh, your whole table did. Individually at our table, we all picked number two, um, but I picked it because I didn't want to be number one. To me, I think there's risk if you're cocky and think you are the best. You want to always be? <laughs> don't want to lose. I don't want to lose the possibility um, to see things that I haven't seen yet. All right, so one more that said that we're somewhat, or we think. Sue? Uh, from Waterford. Or I'll hustle, Sue. Okay, I, I too agree. There's always room for improvement. I used to work in the building department and worked with our planning department. I heard a lot of feedback from people telling us that Waterford was a, a good community to work with, but always room for improvement. All right, so it's good. Next question. Are the elected officials, appointed officials, and staff in their vision for your community? These are similar, four and five. All right, but answer as honest as you can. Uh, how aligned are you? I mean, uh, everybody on the same page? I mean, everybody has a common goal, a common vision? Defaulting to number five on this one. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know our time. All right. We're at 53. Ready? Everybody all in? All in? All done? Auction says. All right. For the most part, we're on the same page. Four. Organized chaos. We got all, four votes for that. Five, we don't talk to each other. All right. I will pick on you if you answer we don't talk to each other. Uh, all right. Um, Steve, when we came to present to Auburn Hills, one of the council members asked you, what's the importance of this? I think you might have asked the importance of it. And Steve's answer was what? What was supposed to be? I'm sorry, the question? The question, when we came to present, and Steve talked about this, uh, well, you want to answer? What do you two answer? Why is it important that you're aligned on this? Well, we're talking, we talk to each other all the time, and the uh, seven members on the council we're always vote seven to nothing. The only time we ever have a problem is somebody has something they don't like in detail. But the planning commission does a marvelous job of doing their job so that when things come to the council, it's just kind of almost a rubber stamp because of everything between the planning commission and the staff. So, so everybody, everybody knows the common goal, the common vision. So by the time it gets all the way up the food chain to you, it's been vetted through what the vision of your community is enough that you've got confidence in it goes. But Steve, you know what I'm driving. I know, but we, we, we can get better. And the, the first session, we, we basically had the Oh, you totally shamed him into saying that. He's humble. Well, well, Henry said, well, we'll give away our trade secrets. And it, no, I mean, it's better that the whole region's stronger. And we, we can get better. And that was the whole point. So so when we presented at Auburn Hills, uh, uh, and Auburn Hills isn't the best. I mean, you guys know that. You, you, you do an excellent job in your planning process and your review process. But you even said, PETA said, you've got things you can work on. That's why you're part of the program. A great comment was made at the council, and, and good councilman here, Henry Maynard, he said, why do we want to share our trade secrets? And then he answered his own question by saying, we can get better, and if we can share something with someone to get better, they may share something with us. But what Steve said that's applicable to this question is most important. He said to his council, the most important thing is our staff is empowered to do what we need to do. Now, this is why it's important to be aligned. Because if your electeds and your appointed planning commissioners and your staff aren't all aligned, your staff don't feel empowered. So when they hold the pre-op meeting, that's so critically important, you all can't be there. The whole city council can't come to a pre-application meeting, for goodness sakes. Your staff needs to feel empowered with the vision and direction of your community so that they can begin to make decisions within that process to move things forward. So when it finally gets to Henry's stage, he's like, they did all the fun work on it. We just got to approve it. Uh, and that's why this is important to be aligned. So let's go to the next question. Steve knows exactly what he can say to a developer of what the council will accept. He understands. Because there's communication up and down the line. All right, next question. <clears throat> How high of a priority is customer service in your community? Right 
Democrat 26, 33, 35, 45. All right, who, who wants to be brave of the four people that said we get complaints? All right, Dan, you can be brave. All right, do it in general context. Don't get Joe behind you in trouble or anything. Well, Sorry, Joe. Not to, you know, not to be critical, but I mean, we're a bit like an expansion football team. I mean, we're good or bad or right or wrong, we're on our third emergency manager, and I don't know that there's complete alignment between all of the elected officials, all of the appointed officials, all the people that are working there. You know, we're trying to reset the compass, get appointed back north, but I wouldn't say that we're there yet. So uh, I guess number four became my uh, my answer to the question. We, we got work to do, but we're heading the right way. In the right direction. So who answered, we're not sure how we handle customers? Goodness gracious, charge out there. <laughs> I know, but I, I think, you know, from a lot of standpoint uh, in a community, if, if the reason I say I'm not sure is just simply because if, if you're not treating your customers in a, in, a, in a manner that you want them to come back, okay, like you said, well, you got to fill out this uh, questionnaire and you got to pay us $20,000 before we start anything, that's the, sending the wrong message. And that's what I want to make sure that in our community we don't do and that we're not doing. But I, I, I just think if you're not always selling, to your customer, and those are the people that are coming into your building officials and that, then you're not you're not selling your community. So having customer service, who would by show of hands, regardless of this, who believes that it should be a top priority in your community, just by show of hands? All right, so everybody in the room pretty much uh, thinks that customer service should be a top priority for you. So if you're an elected official, how would you know that that's happening? Gary, you're an elected official. How would you know customer service is happening. You're not there every day. You're the supervisor. You're there most days. But how do you know it's happening? Do you expect it to happen or does it no. happen like in the Wizard of Oz? Or what, what following up and checking on your departments and department heads and open lines of communication. Creating an expectation of customer service, right? Uh, so is it only the, by show of hands, do you believe it's only the responsibility of the mayor or supervisor, depending on your type of government, to set that tone? No, of course not. Is it the responsibility of a planning commissioner to set that tone? Sure it is. Sure it is. Is it a responsibility of the planning consultant, even if they're privately hired, to set that tone of, of expectation of top priority? Sure it is. That's the importance of this type of priority. Anybody that walks in the door, if you're one-stop ready community, has to be treated like they're going to fill the hole. They're going to fill the gap. Even if you eventually tell them you're just not right for us. They have to feel that they are filling the gap, filling the hole. All right, next question. Do you know the need, how do you know the needs of the business community? And we're going to ask you how after we after answer. Do you know the needs of the business community? Do you know the needs of the business community? Of course, I think, I'm sure, I don't care. I can't wait for someone to answer that. I'm looking at Waterford. No, I'm just teasing. Oh, no, no, I was looking right at Marie when I said that. Sorry, Marie. Sorry. All right, 47. We're trailing off. People are getting less, less wanting to participate than what we picked out here. All right, we're about all in on it. All right. All right. I think I know. Uh, it's probably the answer we would have to get, give it all the time, right? Because not even Brooks knows everything, even though we have our business roundtable. Uh, so you think you know. So is this where I ask them how? Or is it another question? How do they know? Well, how do you know? So of those that answered, I think I know, how do you think you know? Someone. Well, hold on, nobody can hear you. Your business retention program. <laughs> you go out and you meet and talk and develop a relationship. All right, so in Lyon, you go out and you talk to businesses, you learn. Who else thinks they know? How do you think you know? Uh, you already answered. <laughs> well, um, changing uh, face of businesses today, for example, a lot of businesses are moving to technologies, right? And knowing that people don't look for the 40,000 square foot warehouse space with a 5,000 square foot office, but it's quite the opposite nowadays because you've got butts and seats right in software and developing things. So I think that by watching 
those changes in the economic demographics um, helps as well. All right, so we, Lion goes out and talks. You watch some of the changes in the economic profiles. Lori, I saw you had your hand up. How does Auburn Hills think they know the business community? We also do retention visits, but we do them with Oakland County and the state, MEBC, so that we're all on the same page also. And then we watch, like, you know, not only talking to your businesses, but watching what's going on too. Um, you know, the trends, things like that, so that you're aware of things that are coming down the line, not just in Michigan, but outside of our state. So, so let me ask you a question. Hold on, I'll ask you a question. So you, you go on one of these retention visits, so you're going to learn the business community, and they say, you know what, your permit department sucks today because I got, it's been three weeks and I haven't even got a phone call back. What do you do with that information? First of all, that would never happen. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not talking like a business person now, not the deputy executive. I'm, I'm doing like role play here. If I hear it, I go back and I tell whoever it may be. If it's, if it's the permitting, um, Steve would hear it. If it's something to do with the police department, uh, Chief Oakle would hear it. It goes back right to the department head and also Pete Auger. Right, so is there, an, in turn is there an environment where that's expected? For you to it is. Back if I don't do it, they would be upset to hear it from someone else. Someone. That was my job. Right. So think to know. Who said that? Oh, the yes, yes. Chamber, every day we're in the talking to our businesses, and we do get a lot of feedback. And what we do is that meeting we have pick up the phone and call Larry. Since they have a limited staff over there, and Mary's very responsive, and we try to take care of it and find solutions. All right, so what Marie's saying is the chamber's involved with business every day. So who has a chamber in their community? Uh, I think all of you have some form of a chamber, at least they're ancillary, right? Do you guys have a chamber? I know you have DDA in line, but do you have a chamber of commerce, too? Yeah. South line. South line. Right. Sorry if I didn't. Oh, well, that's why I don't know, because I'm avoiding it. I'm just teasing. <laughs> yeah, you know, the important follow-up too to her response is that when you do get that complaint and you go through the channels in your department, somebody better call that person back and tell them you dealt with it and you got to handle it and it won't happen again. Having an expectation that, that the problem is going to get resolved, uh, is that an expectation in all of your communities? Pretty much is. Who would honestly say by show of hands that that happens every time? Does it happen every time? You answer yes, you're just lying. Does. Uh, <laughs> how the heck it does? We, uh, we, walk, we walk the people down. If they call us up, we're, we're the downtown business association. If they call us up and say, look, we can't this, we can't that, we're a problem here. We physically walk down. And we got everybody at this table here, though. You would attest to, we call them and say, look, we got a problem. We got to solve it. And I'm telling you, this team's doing it. That's good. That's First outstanding. Year. So, so here's two things that come off of this. And we have one more question after this, right? So before we go on to the next one, here's two things that come off of this. So part of the program is, is every community has a liaison on it. Um, you can call it a business concierge, you can call it a liaison, you can call it the person that has more work and they're not getting paid, you can call it anything <laughs> whatever, right? Uh, for us, it's that point of contact that gets the help of the dissemination of the information within your, within your structure and your organization. So when you learn things from the business community, your point person when it comes to us will be the liaison from our side that's assigned to you and vice versa. Uh, on it. But most importantly, uh, in, in other communities, like uh, Brian Barnett in Rochester Hills has his business council. I had um, the economic outlook team that we would meet once a month for breakfast. We had, we had like five promises to each other. It's no politicians. It doesn't cost you anything. It's not a fundraiser. You know, all the, the basic promises. After a few meetings, they would start to open up and say, yeah, you know, it's a problem. But here's the unique thing that happens when you do those types of things. Retention calls finds this out all the time, but if you bring them together, we used to hear all of a sudden they'd take over the meeting and they'd be like, well, you know, I need 5,000 square feet of storage because I got a user I can't move in yet. And then another guy would say, well, you can use my back. That's not it. It's empty right now. Get them to the store. And all of a sudden they became their own economic team. And so the more you have communication with the business community, the more hero-like you're going to be because you'll know all of that stuff. So when you hear somebody at the diner say, man, I could use 5,000 square feet of storage, I can get that company in here, you can say, well, yesterday I heard at breakfast that Sam's got it. And you become a hero. So this is why it's important. So let's do the last question. How long do you believe it takes to get a preliminary site plan approved in your community? Oh, this is a good one. Now, all of you are leaders and you are consultants. You better answer honestly on this one, because I think I know everything that it takes. 
How long do you believe it takes to get preliminary site plan approval in your community? What's the start point? Uh, from, from when they walk in the door. Depends, I know. So hedge on it. So think about it from when it's submitted. Let's do it from when they, when they really got an idea they're going to go forward, they bring in plans. All right? So they're going to submit, they write you your silly check. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm putting my attorney hat back on. When they write you that important check, uh, how long do you think it takes from when they submit until they get through preliminary site plan approval? That would be kind of like planning commission says yes, even if they've got to go on for other approvals. Thirty to sixty days. Thirty days and under. Who, is that you? Did you say thirty days and under? No, I did not. <laughs> Come on. No, <laughs> Who said thirty days or less? Uh, well, I must have been. Oh, Dane, <laughs> rascal, you. Uh, all right. So this is encouraging. Uh, thirty to sixty days. Uh, how many of you that answered 30 to 60 days by a show of hands really believe that that's your average? Uh, it likely is. Uh, I mean, we handpicked the seven communities for a reason. Most of your communities kind of get it. Uh, um, some go faster than others. You know, Auburn Hills is lightning, but they hold their pre-app meetings at 6 a.m. on a Saturday if that's when they need to do it. Uh, uh, um, you know, and but all of you are in that ballgame. Wixom goes very fast. Uh, now, this program isn't about going fast. It's about having a knowledge base and an expectation that if a company walks in, you can say to them, in our community, we average somewhere between 30 and 60 days. What's the magic question? Dave, what's the magic question? How long? How, how do you, when do you need to have the door When do you need to have the door open? He lives in Ann Arbor. Give him a second. <laughs> to be in. When do you need to open, right? The magic question is when do you need to open? So the idea of this as part of the One Stop Ready is we go through the next three academies and the remainder, of the, which isn't going to be a very complex program here, we want you to be thinking of, all right, we think it takes 30 to 60 days. Sometimes it takes a little longer. Three of you say, well, a little bit longer. Uh, because it depends on the complexity, I guess, of the plan. We want you to be in this range. You know why? Busy enabling access, you have to have 15-day notice, and it throws everybody's notice stuff off. They should have had 14-day notice in that statute, but that's okay. They didn't realize weeks or seven days. They thought they were seven and a half. Uh, uh, we want you to be in this range. But more importantly, as a one-stop ready community, when somebody comes into your door with an opportunity, you want to be able to ask the question. We need to open. Uh, we need to open by, you know, what's today, June 26 or whatever. So we need to open by October 1st. We want you to say, that's no problem. You're in our range. Uh, here's what you're going to have to do to get that date going. Uh, your deadline for submission is going to be you know, July 14th or whatever the date is on your, on your thing. And have you, what did we talk about when I talked earlier? Project tracking. To have you immediately be thinking, using your liaison, using your pre-app meeting to say, we can meet your timeline. You can be open by October 1st. Here's what you're going to have to do. You create what? The surprise shock on the developer of the attorney's face because you've outsmarted them. They think they're going to have to tell you what they need. And instead, you're telling them what they need to do to make their own darn timeline. And if you start doing that, you're one stop ready. So is that all of our questions? All right, good. All right, so this is the great thing for us. We get to shut up at this point. Uh, so as part of the four sessions, next academy session is going to be the perspective of the investor. All right, so um, we're going to talk a little bit then. But that session, I think Al Kirilik is going to come on it. So from Kirko Development, uh, we want you to learn in the next session from those outside that think that all of you need to improve. But they're not going to come in and say bad things. They're going to say, here's what our demands are in the current modern economy. Here's what our timelines are. Here's what we're facing as development companies. Today, we have a different session. So Brad, why don't you, Brad, 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 why don't you introduce our next guest? Uh, we have uh, tonight Brad Strader. Brad is the, uh, the president of LSL Planning, and they have offices in, in Royal Oak and Grand Rapids and, and out of state also. Brad uh, is the uh, uh, planning and economic consultant for a number of communities in Oakland County and the region. And Kevin Christensen is the director of Econo community and economic development for Farmington. And they uh, have a, a set of slides here that talks about how Farmington has identified their assets, <coughs> aligned those assets with actions and strategies and how those local officials use those strategies as a guide in, in 
planning and economic development in Farmington. Thank you. Brad, Kevin? Kevin and I are kind of used to tag teaming. Thank you very much. So uh, Kevin and I uh, first got working together when he used to work for West Bloomfield Township, but he was working for a developer and I was a consultant for the developer. And we would go to meetings to get things approved and work for Ivanhoe companies. And we went to a meeting one night for Gary Shapiro, if you know him. He stayed home and said, all right, you guys cover the meeting. We went there. And they said, well, let's table them because Brad and Kevin are so entertaining. This really livens up the meeting. Let's bring them back next month. <laughs> and Gary heard that. We couldn't go to any meetings anymore without Gary there. So, uh, But we're here to talk a little bit about Farmington. I'm going to start it off. So Farmington, um, I started our company back in, in August of 1997. And on my way to a meeting with the community to tell them we were starting a company, I got a call from Farmington. And I said, oh, I just started the company. And they said, stop here first. We want to be your client number one. So. Uh, within about an hour of my company forming, Farmington was our client. So they're, they're client number one, so I have a great affection for Farmington, and we've enjoyed working with them since August of 1997. And we began back in, in the late 90s with the, the city council coming up with a vision for where are we in Farmington and what do we want to be. And I'll give them credit, the chart that Matt showed, the economy was humming along, but they knew they needed to be better. Their, Farmington has always been looking for changes. And it really began in 2000 which doesn't show up on this slide, but it was at the peak of that chart where the employment, 2.4% unemployment, I think it was, that Matt showed, when things were at their best, Farmington says, let's be ready, we need to be better to make sure we're getting our share. How can we improve? And one of the advantages, I think, of Farmington is the officials are all on board. They have the same vision. They have different opinions, but they're all on board, and they're always looking at what can they do better, a continuous process in Farmington. So when we did the, the downtown plan, I've done probably 25 downtown plans, and what's the number one thing you hear everybody say, even in Pontiac, that you need downtown from the business is parking. So every community needs parking. So in Farmington, that's what we heard, and we said, all right, instead of parking, let's take the parking lot in the middle of town, and let's make it a town square. And all the officials said, that's pretty radical. All right, let's do it. And so that changed Farmington. That was a catalytic project. So instead of a big parking lot in the middle, when people said we need more parking, Go to Kmart's, lots of parking. Is it vibrant? No. Parking isn't really the solution. It's how do you make it a walkable, vibrant place people want to visit. And we added a green space, put the pavilion in, got vendors involved and patrons involved, and that was kind of a catalyst, a stimulus for other things in Farmington, and Farmington didn't stop there. They said, all right, we've got a lot of speeding traffic in the city. We've got traffic issues. We have county and MDOT roads. What are we going to do? In, in the year 2000, 11 years before complete streets legislation in Michigan, let's say, let's make the streets more walkable. Let's do traffic calming. And they got MDOT to go along with traffic calming in downtown Farmington because they were ahead of the curve. So they've got a lot of professionals that live in Farmington. They're very enthusiastic, ambitious for the city. They don't look little. They think big and bold, and they make it happen. So that's why I love working with Farmington. Um, this just lists some of the other projects. A recreation plan. A master plan in 2000 was updated in 2009. And that master plan said, all right, how do we come, become more redevelopment ready? And instead of just a citywide, kind of a, maybe a bland plan we did the first time, a traditional plan, we said, where are the sites we really need to focus our energy? It started coming up with redevelopment strategies for those sites. And one of the areas we came up with is, after the downtown was kind of set and on its way, what about the edges to the downtown? So the first thing that came out of that was working with Farmington Hills, establish a corridor improvement authority and say, how do we make the east entrance into the downtown better? And we'll talk about that project in a minute. And they're continuing to bring new, new officials on board, new blood, new ideas, and they have the community vision and say, here's where we were. Welcome to the community. Welcome to the board and your commissioner. And what new ideas do you have for us? So now they're going through a, a new visioning process. So here's some of the assets when you look at Farmington. Kevin's going to talk about what they've done to engage or follow up on these, these assets. But I think some of the assets in Farmington that some of you have, maybe not everyone, they have a traditional downtown. But when I started with Farmington, it was sort of a tired traditional downtown and shopping centers in the middle and some of the key ingredients of a successful downtown weren't there. But they have a historic neighborhood, it's a historic downtown, so I think that was a core area. Highly rated efficient services. When people come into Farmington, they move into Farmington, they start a business in Farmington, they come in and just curious about Farmington. Kevin and anybody at the city, they're very welcoming at City Hall. They want to work with developers, as was mentioned by Matt and Dan, and they say, what brought you to Farmington? And we hear these kind of assets. It's it's the natural resources, it's historic neighborhoods, it's convenient access, it's in, you're in the hub, you're in the middle of a growing area around Farmington Hills, 
Um, and a lot of opportunity, people see opportunity in Farmington. They don't see, all right, there's a building that's underutilized or been vacant, they see opportunities. Thanks, Brad. I have to put my eyes on. Sorry about that. That happens over time. Uh, Brad has, you know, kind of alluded to uh, just some of the tools and, you know, a little bit of the foundation uh, that uh, the city of Farmington uh, has established and uh, moves forward uh, with in implementing its economic development plan, its economic development strategies. Uh, we've all just been through a very difficult and challenging time period, whether it started for you in the uh, mid-2000s, 2005, 6, 7. Certainly we saw Matt's slides earlier and Dan and his discussion of that peak period of 2009. Well, everybody was pretty nervous at that time and not knowing what was going to happen next. I think we've seen in the last several years, particularly in this last year, that uh, people are starting to get off uh, the side of the uh, uh, fence and to dip their toe back in the water a little bit. Well, how do you get them to be engaged? And that really is what we're here doing now. You can have all the tools and the plans you want. And again, Matt alluded to the master plan and your development plans, your downtown plans, your uh, overall uh, planning framework. And those tools are very important because without planning, you don't then have your vision set in terms of what your goals are, who do you want, who do you want to be as you come through this time period. But what you really need to do is to have a strategy for how do you engage? How do you get people interested in your community? How does it happen? What makes you attractive? Why, as we say in Farmington, it's happening here. You have to market yourself. You have to know who you are and where you're coming from. My background is in urban planning. I'm a traditionalist. I love planning and zoning. I can talk about that all day. And Brad and I used to do a lot of that. But I am an economic and community development director. I'm there to market, to sell, to engage, and to work with the business community in finding that Farmington is the place to locate. You need to be here because of this. So what do we do? We look at our, our assets in Farmington. We promote our assets. We have a downtown. How many here have a downtown? You're blessed. It's a beautiful asset. Don't ever take it for granted. It's a credit to the uh, development pattern here in the state of Michigan. Our small nodes that became hamlets, that became, became villages, that became towns uh, are gems. If you don't have a downtown, don't fret. There are still things you can do. You can have focus areas. You can have corridors. You can have special areas that become the focal area or the concentration of your community activities, a hub. And I know many of you try, are trying to do that. Any community here that doesn't have a downtown that is looking to try to do something like that, create a hub of activity, a city center, Anybody have them? I know some of you do, because I see you shaking your heads out there. Some with the downtown. Some with the downtown, too. Okay, so what is important? What are assets? For us in Farmington, we took a hard look at what are our values. We have a downtown. Our incentives in the downtown are focused on our downtown. It's the city center of business and activities. It's where we focus a lot of our investment in infrastructure, because without the city investing in its own services, its infrastructure, its support, how can you get business to invest? How can I turn around and have somebody come on to Grand River in downtown Farmington if I have a hodgepodge streetscape that has bad roads, no sewer, no water, no streetscape, no access? We have a brand new streetscape, we have pedestrian amenities, we have lighting, we have sidewalks, we have on-street parking. On-street retail needs on-street parking. You have to look at these sorts of things. Downtown, I'll focus. And we have the zoning in place to do that. It's our central business district, and it's also an area we focus on design standards. We have specific design standards that our business leaders will help us put into place. The kind of things they want to see with their business. Uh, our services, uh, we maintain uh, our development patterns. We're a built-out community. We continue to redevelop, but we redevelop in accordance with what our overall growth plan is. Our transportation and access, very important. We're uh, currently assessing our transportation and access. We're consolidating access. We're sharing parking. We're doing access management and those sorts of things with our planning. Uh, we have a river that runs through uh, the city. We look at that river as a, an asset in the community, an environmental feature. We plan for that and try to incorporate that in linkages uh, throughout our town. Schools I can't speak enough about. Operated schools, uh, if you have schools and you have schools that are very uh, um, pro uh, progressive and are very successful, that is a huge asset for you in terms of place, location, selling to the business community. Uh, civic and historic landmarks. Farmington was uh, established in 1824. Uh, we have 10,400 res residents, 2.7 square miles, and I can't say enough about promoting your history. We have a mansion on Grand River that we promote to all the business communities. We incorporate the mansion with activities and make it part of our community. Uh, we have a historic overlay district, the homes, uh, the other buildings in the community, our assets. They're, they're of significant value. Redevelopment opportunities in our town are everywhere, in our downtown, uh, throughout our community, and we are constantly looking at the redevelopment opportunities. We're not just planning for growth, we're out there recruiting growth right now. So our assets are significant and very valuable. Uh, with respect to economic development, 
and I know we're going fast right now because we're on a fast track of time, and I want to make sure that I can get to Brad's slides here. Uh, officials' role in economic development, like I indicated, I am an urban planner, and I could do plans and zoning and look at the process and take you through reviews uh, all day long, but that does not generate, that does not accommodate, and that does not provide the motivation for business. It's happening in Farmington, and we tell the story. We're proactive. We make it happen. We have a positive attitude. When we talk to people, we're engaging, we're welcoming with them. We go out and uh, actively recruit business. We reach out to various businesses uh, to uh, engage them, in, uh, hopefully with interest in our communities. We certainly look at business retention. We don't want to see business leave. So we make sure, whether it's our DDA or the Chamber of Commerce or city staff, that we work together collectively and are constantly communicating with our business community. We have activities, uh, whether it's festivals or weekend activities or business roundtables or business forums uh, weekly. And we continue to, to discuss and engage and talk because there's no ideas that are wrong. What's wrong is when you don't respond to ideas and you don't constantly communicate. We generate ideas. We express, we share, we engage continuously. We involve a variety of stakeholders. Uh, we are 75% residential. So the residents, the quality of life. When people uh, choose to buy a house in Farmington, they don't buy a house. They buy a community. So we have to act like a community, and that's what we try to do. So we engage our residents to be engaged, in, whether they're uh, on boards and commissions and volunteers, etc. Business owners. Business owners need to be business leaders. They're on the Chamber of Commerce. They're on our corridor improvement authorities. They sit on our planning commission. They are our elected officials. So we have business leaders and business owners who are also part of the uh, public officials and appointed officials uh, in the community. Uh, we uh, sit down weekly and we rank and prioritize our strategy. We have weekly progress meetings of our city staff. We sit down and look at every project going on in the community, we rank them, we prioritize them, and we engage those owners of those projects uh, continuously to make sure they're getting what they need from us. Developing plans for critical areas, uh, we uh, have meetings, uh, we are constantly looking at our road corridors, our focus areas. Brad will talk a little bit more about our Grand River Corridor project. We have a visioning process going on right now. We're constantly looking at small focus areas for redevelopment. We uh, review administrative policies. We have an open door policy. We have uh, an expedited process. We find solutions. When somebody comes into Farmington, I think, what was the slide earlier, a 30 to 60 day process? I press that right away, because that's what we have. That's what business wants. Time is money. They need to know that you're there with them and we'll walk hand in hand with them. Whether you have to go through a city council or a township board or a planning commission or a DDA or other boards and commissions, you need to make it comprehensive and it can't be this time delay. It's got to be expedited. Meet, 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 sit down, have pre-con uh, pre meetings or have you know, actually pre-application meetings is what Matt alluded to and that's what we try to do too. Those are very important. Engage your business interests. Uh, catalytic projects, both public and private, uh, we look to plant the seed. We have a number of projects right now. Public projects, those public projects are so important. A, new, a road update, we're tearing out a road right now in town in front of a shopping center. We actually bought their parking, we're combining it with the road, creating a brand new two-way road with uh, uh, parking on the road. And in doing that, it then stimulated the business owner to do a whole facade improvement to his building. Because we put in the public improvements, which motivated them, planted the seeds for them to reinvest in their building. Collaboration on uh, various boards and commissions, certainly city staff is very unified. Schools I talked about, uh, private sector business owners have to be engaged and involved, and you certainly need your citizens, volunteers appointed. Uh, they need to be engaged and they need to be active. The four things I try to do on a daily basis, and I would hope that you would take this with you. I return phone calls every day. If I get a call from a business person, I don't wait till tomorrow. I call them back every single day, no matter what it takes. We have cell phones, we can do it 24 seven. They'll take your call because they wanna do business. Respond to your emails, you know, big or small. Don't make your emails letter form, but respond to people, engage them, set up meetings. Make them feel that you're there for them. Update, keep your websites current. Whether it's your city website, whether it's a DDA website, whatever your agencies are, keep your websites current and keep them filled with information that's useful. Forms, apps, process, whatever it is. And the other thing is think, act, and work like a business. Because the old adage used to be, well, community cities, you know, we're, we're, we're bureaucratic, you know, uh, we, we are regulatory, we can't act like a business. If you don't act like a business, you're never going to get business to be engaged with you. They want you to be a business with them, your partners. It starts with a plan. All right, and back to me, you can see why we don't let Kevin have any caffeine, because that's his <laughs> And I always think I talk fast, but he tops me. Uh, one thing I was thinking on community assets, we've talked about physical assets, but I think another important thing is that people in the community can be an asset. And I got thinking when Kevin talked about the on-street parking, 
So we have trunk lines, state trunk lines in Farmington. We thought, all right, the state said we're going to remove the on-street parking. We started working for MDOT, like Pontiac's been trying to do, and thought we kept running into roadblocks. Well, then we said, we got the groups together, volunteers, and we said, you know, the son of the MDOT director lives in Farmington. Let's get him involved. There's a planner at MDOT who lives in Farmington. Let's get him on the planning commission. We did those two things, and within nine months, MDOT's attitude changed. So sometimes the assets in your community are people that live in your community that you need to get involved. So I think that's another asset to think about. All right, so it starts with a plan. We've, the, the plan is evolving in a continuous process in Farmington. Some communities do their plan, and then they're done. In Farmington, they do the plan and think we've just begun. And I think that's different. So we mentioned some of the things that we've looked at, but out of the last plan, really looked at streamlining the review procedures. Um, so if Orient Township is 47 days, we will do 46 days in Farmington. You come and we'll beat somebody else's review. We can even beat Wixom in, the, in Farmington, and I think Wixom is about as fast as it comes. And our neighboring community is Farmington Hills. Farmington Hills is not 46 days. So we say, come to Farmington, we will review you quickly, we'll tell you the rules. We might want a certain number of trees, but we'll tell you what they are, we won't table you. You'll know in advance what they are from pre-application. And I think the attitude in Farmington is if you do something that fits the plan and the ordinance, we will approve you quickly. If it doesn't fit the plan, we will tell you no quickly. We're not going to table you and delay you. You'll, you'll know where the project's going or not going pretty quickly. I think that's important for developers just want to know. Uh, incentives to encourage desired development, some of the requirements in the ordinance for like too much parking, looking at setbacks, we've got sort of performance standards in there, we'll let you mix uses, we'll look more at the form of the building than, than the uses that are in the building, being flexible to respond to the market. A lot of things were done in the ordinance a couple of years ago to make it more development friendly. Um, we've identified key redevelopment areas in the plan, we revised the ordinances to do some of the things I mentioned, but also as Matt said, and, and Kevin too, the ordinance is online, it's interactive, it ties into the application form, so somebody like Yum Yum wherever they are, they can look at the ordinance and know exactly what they need to do. They can look at the website and know how long it's going to take them, when the submittal is, when the pre-application meeting is, and when they should be able to get approved and, and in the ground. So that information is there on the web, or Kevin will call them back on a Saturday morning and, and give them the information. And, and Kevin mentioned the city really views their investment on roads and infrastructure, not as, oh, it's time to rebuild this road, but how do we do things to be a catalyst to support the plan, to support redevelopment, support business investment in our community, and Farmington was the first certified redevelopment uh, community in Oakland County. And I should have mentioned on the downtown plan, the county provided the funding to start the downtown plan through its Main Street program, just like the county's provided uh, an incentive for all of you, has been working with Pontiac. So the county had a big role in helping Farmington really uh, revitalize the downtown. So the planning process continues. This was a, a snippet out of the 2009 plan that said, all right, the downtown plan seems to be working. Uh, the neighborhoods seem to be stable. We've had some infill development. We came up with new standards to allow people to expand in their home without having to go get variances and spend money and time to get variances. Um, but this part of, of Farmington was still pretty tired out where it used to be uh, Frank's Nursery out on Orchard Lake, right at Grand River, and said, we really need to do something on the east side of town to make it feel like a grand entrance into the city of Farmington. So they set up a corridor improvement authority with Farmington Hills, and we went through what's called a PET analysis. This is sort of an LSL thing, but it's, it's sort of like the old uh, SWOT analysis. Um, but our idea is really more sort of asset-based, which is what we were asked to talk about today. So we would say, what do you want to preserve in Farmington? What are the assets that we have that we build around? We really want to promote and pronounce and say that we have it. When Matt asked, a couple of you didn't really raise your hands really boldly. We boldly you know, promote what our assets are in Farmington. Then the next thing is, what needs to be enhanced? It could be an asset, but it needs to be improved to really be an asset. And what are those things? And, and we give people little stickers, and they would put them in yellow, or they describe something that, like a neighborhood that's pretty good, but it could be enhanced and become a better asset. And then what are areas that really detract from where we want to be in a city that need to be transformed into something else? A, a street that's in bad condition, a, a site that's dilapidated or blighted or vacant, or a parking lot that needs to be rebuilt, or signs that are they're faded out and so forth. And so we went with... Each of the officials, so we have a Farmington, Farmington Hills group of officials. So the Farmington officials take their maps and they use these little stickers and describe. So green is asset, yellow is enhanced, and red is transformed. And when we gathered all the sheets of Farmington, they're pretty much all the same. We've been working together so much that they identified, and this is just one example map, pretty much identified what are the assets, what do we need to change, and what to change about it, and what needs to be transformed. 
and our neighboring community, Farmington Hills, their officials were there, and their maps, their dots are all over the place. They're not in alliance. They, they haven't really gone through this process like Farmington has. But we started taking this feedback to say, where do we really focus our attention on the plan? And these are some of the focus areas. So out in the east end, uh, by the hospital, the idea like, like Matt had in his employment slide, we've got large, vacant, big and mid-box buildings out there that are not likely going to be reutilized. They're just going to continue to go down and down and down in terms of the quality of, of tenant. So let's get rid of them and let's build on the healthcare industry and let's make a healthcare campus and work with the hospital and look at how can we um, revitalize the area and have a grand entrance to the hospital and really build a healthcare center there. So we not only talk about it, we're doing things to, to make it happen. What else can we do in that area? Um, the Orchard Lake Road corridor in that area where Frank used to be and so forth, that's kind of tired. So we looked at how do we revitalize those shopping centers. And because we did it in the downtown, we said, well, let's start with green space. The work before this area needs green space. It helps meet the county stormwater requirements. And so we've looked at a green space, mixed use, mixing residential with commercial and office, being very flexible in the uses that are allowed, coming up with a new overlay, a form-based code overlay for that area. So that will be the next transformation area within farming. You know, I think it's, it's very important still to note that uh, as Brad went through this a quick example of one of the planning processes that we're going through right now, that you know, your plans are your guide. And plans are intended to be flexible, you all know this. They need to constantly be reviewed and changed, whether you're doing it by rule of thumb or on a case-by-case -case basis or routinely, whether it is at the planning commission level, your legislative body and their input or whatever other uh, board or commission you have and whatever type of plan you have. Your ordinances and your regulations, they continuously have to also be looked at to see if they're achieving the kind of success in uh, implementing the kind of development that you plan for. But those are only tools. The real success is in the process. And that's where it comes down to you. You are the implementers of the process. Again, the plan is a guide. It's a tool. The ordinance is also a tool for implementation, the regulatory approach. But it's the, the uh, people, the staff, those that are in charge of the process that make the difference. That's where engaging in a public-private partnership in a cooperative, collaborative effort totally depends on your preparation and in your approach to recruiting and dealing with business and investment in your community. So how do you market for change? You have to cultivate champions. You have to have broad-based marketing. You need to involve all the stakeholders. Uh, on our quarter improvement board, uh, authority boards, also too on our planning commission and uh, our legislative body, like I said, we have both <coughs> residents and we also have business owners. So we have a mix uh, of leaders in the community. Um, we also have volunteers, um, various organizations and agencies that are very important to us and we share our story and our successes. One of the things I always try to do after every meeting or with any project that's going on is I contact the media. I talk to the media. I introduce our projects to them instead of them guessing what's going on. Because I use them to market our projects. And if they're telling the story the right way and factually, they're going to get it right. So I build that relationship from the beginning. And every time there's a new reporter or somebody else, I talk with them and I sit down with them and I invite them to come in. I invite them to come to meetings. I share plans with them to make sure we all get it right so we're all on the same page. I cultivate the champions. We offer incentives. Leverage city financial resources. We share services with uh, some of the adjacent communities to Farmington, Farmington Hills in particular. We work uh, together uh, cooperatively and collaboratively on various services, including most recently our public safety dispatch. So that's certainly a budgetary issue, but it has made for a more effective and efficient uh, service, and we promote that to our business leaders. We also work on our public improvements, like I said earlier. We take stock in our capital improvement programming, because it's very important that we have quality roads, sewer, water, infrastructure that meets the needs of our residential community, but our business community hand in hand as well. Um, when it looks at leveraging financial resources, we work with the business community and uh, development interests in looking to help them with as much uh, of the financial end as we can publicly. Things like waiving fees, application fees, permit fees, um, charges, uh, or surcharges, waiving tap fees where we can too, at least municip uh, municipally, some we can't. Sometimes when we have to have county sewer, sewer and water fees, we can't necessarily do that, but then we gotta call our friend Matt or Dan to see if they can help us out a little bit there. Uh, other things like downtown facade grants and Main Street assistance. 
Uh, we're part of the uh, Oakland County Main Street program. So that certainly provides and serves us very, very well. And that's very valuable to us as we promote that with our business leaders. Uh, we have a downtown development authority. Our downtown development authority uh, works with our business community in providing uh, facade grants for improvements to building facades. So those things uh, we uh, continue to do and are very successful with tax rebates. Uh, we have done certain things recently and we're getting more involved in establishing commercial rehabilitation districts. I don't know, has anybody uh, done that in any of their communities to date? I know we have Jennifer's here from the MEDC. If you want to talk to her about that a little bit later, she might be able to answer some of your questions. But we look to use that tool as a resource uh, for a, uh, a tax uh, reboot, a reboot or tax incentive for our businesses. We also have in our downtown a, a TIF district that's established in our Grand River uh, Corridor Improvement Authority also uh, after the development plan is uh, completed and then reviewed by Dan and uh, Matt and their team here. We hope to establish our Grand River Corridor uh, as a TIF district as well. Uh, other creative funding uh, strategies, grants, contributions. Uh, we certainly look to see what kind of grants are available for different things, public improvements in particular. Uh, we have a Grand River Corridor that we've improved with grant monies. We're looking to hopefully keep your fingers crossed. Uh, hear back soon from SEMCOG in the state regarding a grant application to actually for our farm, Farmington Road streetscape, which is going to mirror our Grand River streetscape, and we'll look to use that hopefully uh, in the future. Non-traditional -tra uh, funding sources, uh, we do engage county and state uh, for uh, road assistance uh, funding. We have uh, been successful with that before. Grand River is a, uh, a, um, a major artery that goes through downtown Farmington, so we have to continue to work with MDOT in Oakland County. Uh, in our downtown area, and we continue to do so. Business promotion, we have a Chamber of Commerce, the Greater Farmington Area Chamber of Commerce, very active, and we coordinate with them. Like I said, our DDA, our business owners, and our business leaders. We have uh, bi-monthly uh, meetings with our business community, where we promote the community uh, from a economic and community development standpoint. Uh, sometimes we look to select, in a certain location in the city, business leaders, and invite them in, come to a lunch, and work with them, and go through the planning that we have, but also the projects that we're doing, and then what um, uh, opportunities are available for them. So we continue to co coordinate and communicate there. And uh, special assessment districts, we have two projects in town where we have uh, entered into a cooperative, collaborative effort with the business owners of two shopping centers, whereby we entered into creating an SAD where monies were provided to them uh, from the city. The city provided funding for them to uh, do improvements to uh, internally and externally their businesses to upgrade them, breathe new life into them. And uh, the whole process then was predicated around bonds being provided in order to do that, providing the funding to the private business owner, and then SADs being established where the payback could be over a certain number of years at a certain interest rate. And we've done that in two different occasions very successfully. Uh, so it's, it's worked out very well for us. What's next? As I indicated, changes along Grand River Avenue and Farmington Road, and everybody knows where Farmington's at for the most part here in Oakland County, if we're all Oakland Countyans, I'm sure we all do. Um, uh, the existing conditions inventory, one of the things we're embarking upon right now is creating a very detailed and comprehensive economic database. You have to know who you are. It's easy to know your address, your tax ID, your business owner, your uh, assessed value, your taxable value, uh, your zoning and your planning, but you need to know existing site conditions. You have to take an inventory. You have to look at your buildings, the age, the condition, uh, your facilities, the support services, uh, access, driveways, landscaping, signage, all those other attributes, and assess them and good, get a good handle on where you're at right now currently, and pinpoint where you want to make changes, and then put together a program as to how to engage those shopping center owners or those business owners and what you can do to work together cooperatively and collaboratively with them. And we're in the process of doing that right now. Uh, identify key parcels and buildings for renovation. Again, through that you can do uh, prioritization of them and actually put together a marketing approach because if you have successful areas, they're hopefully going to breed other successful areas. And the ones that aren't going so well right now, once you target them, then you can target what kind of businesses you want to have in there and go out and get those businesses, or at least recruit, whether it's national, regional, local, what have you. Uh, community redevelopment plan, we're going through a vision plan right now. Uh, that vision plan in Farmington was done in 1998. We right now have a group of stakeholders throughout the community, residents, business owners, uh, others that are interested, and we are working together and completing a visioning plan for the entire community for now and into the future, looking to uh, update then our master plan, our DDA plan, uh, our uh, other planning tools uh, in the next several years. Uh, ongoing collaboration with private sector and property owners, that's probably the key. You have to establish relationships. You have to establish them, you have to foster generate them, you have to continue to build them, and you have to keep them. Working together is the way that you're going to breed success, the cooperative, collaborative effort. And I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying you have to enter into a true private-public partnership. Our attorneys 
have told me they sometimes don't necessarily like that uh, uh, distinction. They would rather see us instead of a partnership scenario, because in a partnership or a true partnership, you end up being liable for each other's actions. You gotta be a little bit mindful of that. So I like to look at these efforts as being cooperative, collaborative, engaging, and looking for that win-win. And I've got just one thing to add. How many of you have an iPhone? You, you, okay, a lot of you, all right. So I have a new iPhone and trying to figure out, just got it, trying to figure out how to use the camera and my daughter's like, Dad, that's a selfie, you gotta rotate. Or, so it takes your own picture, you know, instead of what you're, you're aiming at. So I used, I was in suburban Pittsburgh last year, last night, and I used my iPhone because we had a meeting on a comp plan. We're kind of done, we've done scenario planning and, and somebody said, well, what's the key thing to make this happen? And so I said, I've got the key thing right here. And so they said, if you really want to know the secret to making this happen, come up and you can look, it's on my iPhone. So they would, each one was coming up, they'd pass around, and it was a, it would take a picture of themselves. So pass it around, and you by being here, I think, show your commitment, but you are the keys to making this happen. Kevin's the key in making Farmington, all the individuals working together. But I, you know, I've worked in other communities where you don't have that kind of energy ambition. You don't have the staff having the same vision. They say, we'll outlast the officials. We're just going to keep doing it the way we've always done it. In Farmington, the officials and staff, they all work together. They work with the businesses. But you're the key. So if I pass my iPhone around, you know, you're the key to make it happen in your community. To, to listen to these sessions that you're at, to think, how do we carry this back? How do we work together and look at collaboration instead of conflict? I think that's a real important thing to take from tonight. So we thank you for listening to us in our rapid discussion. All right, so we have a little bit of time. Uh, Cabrera hit his 22nd home run. They're 2-2 two, two in the third. So we're not missing too much. Tori Hunter hit one, too. So 2-2 two, two in the third. Um, all right, so to, to finish up tonight, uh, uh, today's goal in session number one, academy session number one, was to get you thinking about Christians and talking 100 miles an hour of, of their context, but to get thinking, you thinking about your community in the context of who you are. Kind of that old economic role, got this huge hole to fill still. We can't erase 2003 to 2013 overnight. You know that if we're, you know, if we lost 36% of the net total wealth of our county in 10 years. To replace that wealth, building by building, is going to take a long time. But if we all collaboratively try to beat each other on it, we can get there quicker. Together, we can do that. So I'm sure, now Kevin, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. Uh, if one of these communities called you and said, you talk too fast, I didn't get it all down, uh, <laughs> can you help me out? I want to talk to you about three or four things. You'd help them, right? Absolutely. Well, I coach six different teams of kids, all right? And I talk real fast. So they better catch on or else they're going to get left behind. But we always have time for locker room talk. Call me. Let's go to the website. I have business cards. I'm all about success stories and helping you with what you're looking to do, if I can help you do that and answer questions. There's so no one size fits all. At the end of this program, when you finish and you, we all say, yeah, you are one-stop ready communities, the, the end game is you're not going to get an award. You're going to award yourself something, all right? The final part of this program as you go forward to keep you in the program going forward is we're going to have a nice celebration. Oakland County Love Parties. It'll probably be beer and wine. I mean, you know what it always is. Uh, but we're going to ask you to give yourself an award when this is all done. We're going to ask you to say, here's the best thing we do, and this is how we do it. This is why we're proud of it. And the other communities are going to listen to that, and our hope is, is that for the next year, we say, well, how do you do the next year? Because you certainly don't want to sit through all this stuff again. We want you to be sharing ideas, adopting something that one of your partner communities are doing. And as this program grows, and we have hopefully all 61 communities, it will be a great forum celebration of people sharing, hey, this year we did this cool bond program and this is how we did it and this is what resulted from it. Hey, this year we rewrote part of our master plan, but we did it, you know, some of you might have caught the, the thing that they talked about form code overlays, and those are real technical terms. And I wouldn't expect that everybody will even ever know what that ever is, but I'm hoping that you hear those things and you start asking your leadership and your staff, what in the heck were they talking about? Because as soon as you start asking the question, you become an economic developer in your community. You start learning from each other. And so they're, they're willing to share. But let's do one something real quick. It's only 8.13 or so, so we'll get out of here in a few minutes. What's one thing that you did hear from them? Because I heard one thing that I think might be different than the rest of you. Uh, so what's, what's one, who hasn't shared an answer today? What's one thing you heard that they're doing that you thought was pretty cool? 
What's one thing you heard that they're doing that you thought was pretty cool and friendly to know? The media, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Isn't it an easy way to sell what you're doing? I don't let the press sell it for you. It doesn't cost you anything except phone call and leverage, right? Uh, what's one thing, though? Well, I took from what they were saying is business owners have to be business leaders. And and creating those champions in your community so you don't have to do all the work, right? Yeah, I mean, if you engage those. Uh, what, what's another one? Just you can shout it out. Chris Inlow, the engineer. I mean, Knows me from the old days. Uh, Chris, what's one thing you heard that Farmington's doing that you you think is cool as a consultant? Well, uh, working collaboratively with NDOT and Rural Commission, getting, getting the streets, getting it, and uh, creating SAD network and getting working with all the stakeholders around. So understanding the interconnection and economic development between having stakeholders, having the approval process at MDOT, because you got to go through that, but leveraging it as an asset to sell to your business community. Now, why, why is that important? Most communities think, well, eventually all of that stuff will get built when some rich developer comes in and redevelops that property. Uh, how many times has that happened in the last three years in your community where you just waited for the big check writer to come in and they fixed everything? If you raise your hand, you're lying. That doesn't happen anymore. Uh, those days are long gone. The economy is moving in a whole different direction. That's why we had Bob Dylan up there. Times are changing. When we travel all over the world to find, you know, we're up to 908 foreign owned corporations in our county. We're second only to, I think, the Fairfax County, Virginia folks, but I'm convinced we're better, Dan. So, uh, uh, you know, we're from 38 different countries here. When we travel around the world and find companies to come locate here, we're not locating. I don't know if you know this, but we haven't built a manufacturing factory in this town in a while. The two and a half billion in emerging sectors, that's like startup small stuff, five jobs. Maybe we get a hundred jobs out of one of them and that's a big one uh, when we come in. We're, we're, we're battling for a different market. So understanding all these assets. But I'm gonna leave you on this, what I heard from the presentation and what all of you need to hear from that presentation. You're gonna go away here thinking, we do a lot of that stuff and we're all that too, man. We're cool. But here's what I heard, they said, if you do it in 47 days, we'll do it in 46. That means there's a community in your neighborhood that wants to share their talents and they'll do it freely, but they want to kick your ass. <laughs> All right? I am. This is good will. Right. You have to have that mentality that we all are going to kick each other's. Sorry, I swear, but that's not too bad tonight, really. You have to have the mentality on your planning commission that. You know what? I understand. We got a big hole to fill. Yeah. And when a project comes in that's not right for us, you need to tell them right away. That's called customer service. When a project that does fit but you're just not sure, you need to have in the back of your head, Farming to Hills will figure out a way to make it sure. And they want to do it faster than you. So it's not about speed. It's about having that total context of how to do it. And you should be asking the questions as leaders in your economic context. You should know, as a planning commissioner, how much is our hole we have to fill. You got to talk somewhere. You just talk like eight thousand words. Well, one thing to correct you: we're Farmington. Oh, sorry, okay. Farmington. We are who we are, and we're not afraid to say no. But it's our job to help them find a way to find yes. To That's find what yes. We do. You have to find yes. That's the mentality. So when you hear them rattle off all those things. And you're sitting there as a planning commissioner, and maybe there's only two things on your planning commission agenda. Uh, you want to drive your consultants into euphoria, uh, and your staff into, euph well, maybe not the staff, but the consultants into euphoria. You say, you know what? We only got two things on the agenda. I want to add three more. I want to talk about three ways that we can incentivize business development through the planning commission. Uh, and I expect staff and consultants to bring it to our planning commission so you can collaboratively engage in the stuff that makes your community different. Because if you don't do it, places like Farmington Hills, sorry, Farmington, why do I do that? Jeez, man, you got to lose it. Farmington's going to kick your ass. It's the speech I gave when I was supervisor in Orion. My job was to make Orion Township the best economic development engine possible out there. And we collaborated with Auburn Hills. Pete and I meet all the time, Brian Brown from Rochester Hills, but we'd have a friendly competition. We shared ideas. But at the end of the day, over a beer, we all kind of walked away saying, well, tomorrow I'm going back to kicking your butt. So have that mentality. So we want to thank you for engaging. Now here's your homework. Homework, you have homework. Uh, you have to 
recite everything that Kevin said before you. <laughs> no, you can't do it, right? All right, now here's your homework. Uh, we want these to be this way. Kind of learn, listen, engage a little bit. I'm going to be at every one to draw it out of you. Get expecting to answer questions. If you did it this time, Tony, I'll probably pick on you next time, all right? Uh, we want to hear your ideas and your thoughts. We want to hear what you're doing in your community. Not only we, but your partners in all of this want to hear that from your other communities. We want to hear what you're doing. Uh, we had a good turnout. We didn't have a good enough turnout. Oftentimes in this scenario, you are all the ones that want to do this. There's people that aren't here that could care less. They'll look you in the eye and say they do. Uh, so don't go tell them, oh, Gibbs said you don't care, you care less, because then they won't come, and then they'll call Brooks and I'm in trouble. But your job as leaders is to encourage them to say, you know what, guys, there's communities out there like Farmington, uh, and there's communities not even in Oakland County. I mean, think about it. Grand Rapids, who's in the media most of all about who's getting economic development around here? Uh, what's happening in Washtenaw County in Ann Arbor uh, with the redevelopment of the Pfizer site? What's happening? Oh, wait, where's the big 500-pound gorilla right now? Uh, well, it's just south of here. They're about to build a $650 million arena for the hockey team down there. Uh, we had Dan Gilbert buying building after building and giving away space. They call themselves the IT capital. There's more IT companies in Troy, Michigan than Detroit ever dreamed of. Uh, but do we, do we help sell that? Does Troy sell that? Irene Spanos calls it IT in the OC. Uh, I mean, are we really collaboratively doing that? Uh, so we want to have Detroit grow and have success. It makes us better. We want to have Ann Arbor be, well, we don't, Dave, sorry. I know you live there. But, uh, you have to be aware that it's not just Farmington. There's communities throughout the state of Michigan. There's places like Denver, Colorado. Now remember this. When we put up the sector stuff where people are working, manufacturing's changing, all those good things, the biggest thing that's changing out there in the economy is that a 22-year-old kid can make a million dollars on his iPad. He doesn't need to be in Auburn Hills. He could be in Kuala Lumpur and make the same million dollars. So if you're going to distinguish yourself, you have to convince not only the people that want to buy a house there, because you have to sell houses, you have to convince those businesses, this is why in the heck they want to be there in the first place. And you can only convince them if you can ask the right question. What's the right question? How soon do you have to have the doors open? There you go. All right, so thanks for tonight. You guys know the next session is July 24th. Your homework is to bring more of your leaders in your community to these sessions and expect to get picked on. Good night. Go watch the Tigers.